Okay, today I wanted to present uh, a new project that I finally finished up, but I wanted to go over some basic principles behind it. And it's something that's kind of important to me. So, mainly data. What is data? Well, besides being an awesome character in Star Trek, it is also a collection of information that usually people create in order to uh, complete a task or to um, preserve some kind of information. So lots of data can take various different forms. And for most people, uh, individuals, we might produce some data like uh, family photos, videos. Um, we'll have music and movies that we might have purchased. We'll have... Uh, any kind of like school assignments, uh, paperwork. Um, we'd also potentially, if you're like me, you might have a lot of software projects going on where you have uh, a mildly large code base that you've been working on continuously for, you know, five odd years or something. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of effort in order to create all that data. And um, the last thing you want to see is to wake up one day and find it's all gone. Five years of tweaking and poking and prodding, lessons learned and uh, fixes and features and ideas all gone in the blink of an eye. So way around that is, of course, backups. For data, you can have data loss. Now that can be anything... Um, both man-made and essentially natural. So man-made examples of data loss, accidentally deleting something that you did. Um, also things like theft. Someone steals like your laptop that has also important data on it. That data is lost. Uh, it could also be um, mistakes like, you know, physical damage, dropping a laptop down the stairs and destroying it. Uh, but you can also have more natural kind of causes like um, fire, flood, um, hurricanes, tornadoes. Those are all quite possible, and they all can severely uh, cause a lot of amount of data loss for people. And uh, the primary risk mitigation for data loss is backups. One great thing about computers is they can copy data from one place to another very, very easily. And... Uh, it's what they're primarily designed to do. So we create backups. That's where we just essentially copy your data from location A to location B. And uh, how this is done and where these locations are all can vary depending on how much risk you want to reduce. There's pretty much a general category of like easy backups like... Uh, grab this <laughs> usb sticks this is an ancient one um 128 megabytes uh you create some files on your computer like schoolwork or uh for example and you just put an extra copy onto a usb stick and you keep it with you or you keep it hidden someplace safe like like for example a safe and that's a good way to to mitigate some data loss that's definitely a, a good source of a backup but any good backup uh, pretty much depends on a couple things. Uh, primarily, uh, completeness. How much data are you backing up? And uh, the other category is freshness. How new is the data on that backup? If this backup is like from months ago and you've since made a lot of changes, it's better than nothing but it's still a significant amount of data loss. So, uh, in, for example, completeness, I guess it would be making sure that you actually get everything that you want to back up because um, your backup media might be very small and you might not be able to store everything. So any kind of backup is going to need both a good amount of completeness and a lot of freshness in order to be really, really, really useful. With any kind of simple backup, like file copies, where you take a folder and copy it to a, another folder on the same computer. 
That's great for accidental deletions or uh, in case you make some kind of weird, crazy changes and you don't want to, uh, if you need to go backwards, you can easily. And this is really common for a lot of people. But this might all be contained on the same laptop and uh, the laptop goes tumbling down the stairs or falls into a river. It's not going to work. So this is where you get into, for example, USB sticks and uh, potentially external hard drives, which I don't have an example with me right off the bat. Um, but those are great ways to do some easy backups. Then there's also categories of like automatic backups. So an easy way for consumer devices to do this is what they call a NAS, Network Attached Storage. These are getting much, much more common um, anymore because you can build one of these things for fairly cheap. And what it essentially is, is a hard drive that is attached to your network of all your other systems. So all your other computers then can easily access all the files that are stored on this NAS and make all the modifications on here. Then this NAS is essentially a full-blown computer, and you can have off of it an external hard drive. And he can make the backups to it occasionally. And NAS is not a backup. Uh, you'll find some NASs run with uh, RAID arrays. RAID. Redundant array of independent disks. And uh, that essentially means it takes multiple hard drives. Yeah. This is where you get your multiple hard drives. Scribbles. Uh, you get your multiple hard drives all connected to the NAS. And um, this way it can combine the storage of all these hard drives. But there's different kinds of RAID, um, what they call levels, from RAID 0 up to uh, RAID 6. And there's a whole bunch of different combinations. But essentially, most RAIDs work so that if you lose a hard drive, one dies, that's okay. You still have all the data is spread across all the other hard drives. So you don't lose your data permanently. Uh, different levels of RAIDs have different amount of redundancy. Some of them don't have any redundancy, such as uh, RAID 0, and a lot of people argue that's not really RAID. But, um, whatever. We'll go with the ones that, we'll just talk about the ones that are, are uh, going to be built in redundancy like this. So with the redundancy, you can take hardware losses and still maintain data losses. So that was definitely one of the one of the potential data loss points was hardware failure. Now, this will reduce the risk of an individual hardware hard drive dying and taking all your data with it. But you still have a single point of failure, and this is the NAS itself. Um, if he dies, you at the best temporarily lose access to your data. At the worst, um, like, for example, the power supply in this thing explodes and decides to short 120 volts to every drive, and all of them catastrophically explode into a ball of fire. So this is not a single, this is not a, a source of backup. It's a source of redundancy in order to reduce hard drive failure, so it can reduce data loss, but it's not a backup. Um, you can have external drives directly attached right off these things. And this was a, a backup, but it's still, you know, directly attached. So it's still not mitigating a whole lot of risk. Uh, it still can, you can still have a catastrophic failure in the NAS and potentially kill everything along with it. And uh, usually because this is right next to each other, um, it doesn't uh, mitigate any risk from like theft or fire or flood. So definitely uh, a good step in the right direction, but not the final solution. So, <clears throat> the nice thing, like I said, though, these NASs can be set up because they're full systems. They can automatically push backups out of them. So, they can, whatever data they get, they can automatically push out to other data on predefined schedules or automatically. So, any changes are immediately pushed out to the backup. Or you can put them on a regular schedule so that it does it periodically. And um, there's benefits and reasons why you would want to do always push out backups and only occasionally push out backups. Um, one of the nice things, like if you, uh, occasional backups, if you accidentally delete a file you didn't want to, you can quickly go back to the backup 
and uh, pull the data back out of there before it's completely gone. If it was an automatic push, yeah, if you delete it off the NAS, it would likely delete it off the backup as well to keep everything in sync. So there's um, there's definitely reasons why you want to consider which kind of scheduling you want to do with your backups. So business solutions, businesses push out a lot of data all the time, where there's either financial or if you got like a technical business where there's a lot of source code, they'll be pushing data out to backups, not only um, in the same facility, like for example, uh, people's Work like work laptops are not going to be storing all their data. They're going to be pushed out to network drives like a NAS. That'll hold all the data. And then those NASs can be push, pushing data out to other backups. Not only can they do that um, in the for drives directly attached to the NAS itself, if you have a building here, you can go with the power of the cloud, the good old internet, and push it out to another facility in your same business. This is uh, off-site backups. And this is probably the best way to do it because it gives you, uh, a, with the power of the always connected internet, gives you a fairly fresh data out there. But uh, being separately disjointed buildings, it pretty much eliminates the risks of fire, flood, natural disasters, or maybe even, th probably even theft, because it's likely, less likely two people are going to steal the same hard drives at the same time. Uh, this is obviously the great way of uh, any business can do it because they can push their data back and forth so they can share their backups between each facility so they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. And um, that obviously works if you have two buildings with uh, two system administrators running two systems and coordinating between all that. And uh, it doesn't require too much data or uh, too much uh, cost to do that, really, just the, the data, the uh, the systems themselves. So that's not too bad of a way to do it. Um, for your average homeowner, though, you pretty much only have one home. You might be able to set up a separate backup on like a parent's house where you can push all your data out to your parent's house and vice versa. Again, though, that, that requires some extra setup and maintenance, which is probably one of the big trouble things. And then if something goes wrong with this backup, and it's not working, you would have to rely on your parents in order to try and fix it. <laughs> and you're also pushing it across the internet, which might not be uh, very fast. So I guess I should draw a nice house. Go into a house. Oops, that's a weird house. And they're pushing out to the internet. And so you're pushing data out to your parents. But uh, like I said, you would have to maintain that system. And depending on how far these houses are apart, it could be very hard to maintain it. The other option a lot of people do is there are online services such as like a Google Drive, a, well, it's a Microsoft OneDrive or whatever the hell it is. And then there's some, there's some other actual dedicated backup systems like Dropbox and such where they, uh, they are essentially an internet only entity and they exist, they appear essentially as a hard drive so you can push data out to it and you can continuously push data out and that works pretty well as a backup because they're going to be doing lots of their own backups on their data they're going to have redundancy built in so if they lose a hardware that's fine they can still recover it and they'll probably have stuff like this where they'll have multiple disjoint buildings and they're going to be backing up to those ones too downside of this is uh uh, cost a monthly fee in order to keep stuff in there. And if you don't continue to pay, it might go away completely. So it's uh, it's not a whole lot, but it's definitely more than free. So I decided to... I have in my network, which I'll, I'll show you my NAS. Um, I have a NAS, a 4-drive in uh, RAID 5 array. And that gives me a redundancy in the, the hard drives, but it still gives me a single point of failure on the NAS. I also then also have an external hard drive attached to the NAS, which continuously backs up to it. So that gives me um, extremely fresh backups, um, but it's, it's not a big hard drive, so it's not going to give me completeness that I, that I would like. 
And then it's also, you know, single point of failure because it's still attached to the NAS itself. So I wanted something, something that would give me the convenience of having like a separate disjoint location, but being easy to maintain and essentially free. So that's where I came up with this idea of uh, kind of what I call a local remote backup. Um, it's essentially just another hardware, another NAS that is attached to my network over the wonderful world of Wi-Fi. And uh, so over here, I would have a, a, a Wi-Fi router and he gives me Wi-Fi. So he is in a separate building in a shed out back and he's powered off electricity because I got electricity out to the shed. So this gives me a, this reduces the risk on a few different levels because it, it reduces the risk of uh, fire and flood and probably theft too because there's less likely a, a thief is going to walk into a house, steal all this stuff, and then bother to go all the way out to the dirty shed and try and dig around for stuff. Um, most thieves don't really go for both at the same time. So it probably reduces the risk of theft. But it gives me, you know, two separate copies of the data and two essentially sort of separate. I, I don't, I don't uh, eliminate the risk of things like hurricanes and tornadoes. Luckily, those are fairly rare. So um, I'll consider those risks I'm willing to take. And uh, I still have, a, you know, a single point of failure because they are being powered by the same electrical grid. But, yeah. As long as you have a really good filtering, you probably won't have to worry about that. And then this NAS hard drive has an enormous hard drive, so I get my completeness. And this one is set up, I think right now, at weekly schedules. So it gives me moderate freshness. Not as fresh as this stuff, but if, for example, I delete something off and it's, kind of, it's really gone off the NAS, then I need to grab it back out of this one, which I can do. So I'm going to go and show you my NAS, my current backup system over here, and then I'm going to show you what I built for this guy. Okay, so this is my NAS over here in the corner of my basement. It's actually fairly high up to the ceiling, so I don't have to worry about, you know, really bad flooding down here or anything like that. But uh, this is a, a QNAP TS-459. He's running four uh, three terabyte um, HDSD hard drives and uh, they are arranged in a RAID 5 array. So I can pull out one hard drive entirely. If it fails or if I just want to pull it out, I can pull it out, and uh, the RAID will continue working on the three other drives. Any of the data that's stuck on this one is pretty much broken into three other chunks that's shared on the other ones. And that's how they do that for any of the drives. So I can pull out any of them and still survive. But it is a single point of failure because it is one NAS. And uh, off to the back here, I have a two terabyte drive off to the side that's connected over the eSATA. And he gives me, you know, the, the immediate backups of the really important data. But he's much smaller than this guy. This is, you know, 12 terabytes of data, but it's really only about eight terabytes of effective storage because of the RAID array. So I can't fit all that onto this drive. So I only have the critical stuff on here. And that's when I needed something else. Something else to give me the completeness and the uh, eliminate the, the proximity of the backup from the actual data. And uh, all this is on a big, chunky battery backup that conditions it and keeps it alive in case of sudden power outages. And they're all connected up through the network. And they're... I will show you my uh, the Wi-Fi solution later. But let's go back to the bench, and I will show you my remote, local remote system that I built. All right, so for a local remote system, essentially what I need is a NAS, which is both a, a hard drive and then a little computer that's connected to the network. And uh, I went through a different few revisions and a couple ideas of what I thought I should do. Then I remembered. I had an external SCSI hard drive from long, 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 long ago. Um, don't know what happened to the actual hard drive, but I kept the case because it was kind of nice because it was a full, big, chunky external uh, case with its own power supply. And uh, thought, hmm, maybe I should try and use it for this. So from the exterior, it looks like it originally did. 
excuse me. But from the back, what I did is I removed one of the uh, SCSI 1 connectors and then just kind of hodgepodged in these two ports on the back. So one is a network port, um, and then the other is a USB port, which goes to a long range USB Wi Fi adapter. And I'll show you some more of this guy later. And otherwise, from the exterior appearances, that's about all he looks. Looks about the same. So let's crack them open and show you what I got inside. Okay, inside is probably pretty much what you expected. So it's uh, the standard power supply that came off of the system. This is a, a 12 volt and 5 volt power supply. I think it's 12 volt at like a 1 amp and then 5 volts at like 3 amps. So it's pretty chunky and works very well. It's uh, built with uh, Rubicon caps and has all the requisite input filtering. And um, this was a kind of a commercial off the shelf. Uh, power supply that this company built the whole case around so this is a easily replaceable if i need to and it has you know a nice um dedicated power switch and connectors and then a decent chunky fan blowing out so keep cooling and uh then on the other side was the uh where the SCSI hard drive lived and just a couple cables and i think this case was originally built to also fit um big five and a quarter like uh SCSI cd-rom drives but uh i never seen them with that configuration. I've seen these cases online a couple times on eBay. Um, so they exist. Um, it's made by some guy, some drive, a company called Power Drive out in Arizona, but I've, I've never heard of them otherwise. So uh, the hard drive itself is a nice, big, chunky, six terabyte Western Digital Blue. And uh, he runs a slow, like 5,400 RPM, but he remains stone cold because he's going so slow. And this is the Ethernet connector and the USB connector coming off the back. And it's going into what you probably expect, which is a Raspberry Pi. This is a Raspberry Pi 2. Uh, I didn't bother with the 3. I didn't really need the extra performance for it. And you can pick the 2s off um, eBay used for... Yeah, $10 cheaper than, you know, a new three, eh, whatever. I'm not going to use the Wi-Fi on the three anyway, so it would just be dead space. But, um, so connect up the, the Ethernet for uh, permanent wired in situations and uh, power here and, and uh, USB for the other USB devices. So underneath this then is a USB hub because the power requirements of especially the Wi-Fi adapter, are very high. So I needed something to uh, give a clean power to every device. And pretty much the best way to do that was a USB hub. And I can give them power directly off of the connector. So it came you know, standard four pin Molex connector and I needed to go to an adapter for the SATA power connector. So that gave me a perfect opportunity to uh, tap in and grab the five volt and power off the hub. So then that powers off the hub and then also the Raspberry Pi and then the Wi-Fi adapter. So it all kind of fits snugly in there. And then one last other thing was a USB to SATA uh, adapter. And this guy has a little bit of a modification to him, which I have made a previous video when I actually tore it apart and did this mod to it. So I shall play that video now. Okay, so this video is being shot in the past. Um, I built some of the circuit and I wanted to show it off before I put it back together and uh, installed on the rest of the system. So when I first did this drive, I used one of my existing USB to SATA adapters um, that I had laying around. I do not remember how old it was. I don't even know what brand it is. It's using a J Micron chipset. Um, as far as that, I don't know what brand it was, but it did work fairly reliably for me. So I thought, ah, sure, why not use it? And I wanted to simulate the LED uh, on the front of the case, the hard drive activity LED. So this one. Whoops, this adapter already has a little LED in this. It's a bicolor LED, so I think it's green um, when it's always on, and then it flashes red during hard drive activity. So it was easy enough to go in there and um, desolder the one leg of the LED and then connect up 
to the LED that was in the case, and then that would flash the LED in the front of the case and show me some really nice hard drive activity, which worked fine. And it worked like any traditional blinking uh, LED hard drive. But the problem with this is this is an older uh, chipset that doesn't support the large block addressing. So it couldn't handle anything larger than a one and a half terabyte hard drive. Um, so when I had my, uh, my first attempt at this, used a, a large hard drive and when it formatted, I didn't realize it and I filled it up quick and then I was very confused as to why. And that's because the partition was only 1.7 terabytes and change. So that forced me to go down a different route, find a newer uh, updated USB to SATA uh, controller. So I went around and found this guy, a Vantech ID to SATA USB 3.0 adapter. Obviously the Raspberry Pi doesn't have USB 3, but that's fine. I'll be forward upgradable. And the reason I went with this one is because it definitely said that it supported up to at least eight terabyte hard drives. And um, so it did have the large block addressing. And this is the only one I could really find that did that and had LEDs in the case. Now, the problem is I was kind of suspicious because it has two LEDs on here and the symbols are really ambiguous. It's just a square with a, a lightning bolt and a circle. I'm, my only guess is that they thought that, you know, this is supposed to be um, USB activity, not hard drive activity. That's my only thought as to what they were doing with that. And I think that's what it is. So I tore it apart and investigated. And I came to the conclusion that it is running a Inotech IS611 chipset. I can't find any data on this. It's, it's like it's just from a, a Chinese manufacturer. They don't put their part sheets online. And I tried emailing them and I got no response. So... I assume that they're not going to give me a response. And um, so I couldn't figure out the pinout to this. I did look at the LEDs, and I probed them out with a multimeter. And I found that they are connected together in parallel. The two LEDs don't do anything different. Uh, so I did some debugging to figure out what was going on. This is my initial note, so they're a little sketchy. Um, so 5 volt USB from the USB connector is coming in, going through the two LEDs in parallel, down through a 330 ohm resistor, and then that directly connects to uh, one of the pins on this IS611 chipset. I'm not exactly sure what their pin numbering scheme was, but if that's the pin 1 indicator, this is the second one south from the uh, other side. Um, what I'm suspecting is inside is just a FET that just goes to ground. That's really typical for some of these devices like uh, USB controllers and also a lot of like Ethernet FIs. So they just have, um, when you want to flash the LED, it just grounds it out. And that way they don't have to worry about trying to drive power out to the LED to, to control it. They only just bother controlling the ground and then you supply whatever voltage you need for your LEDs. The, uh, the problem I noticed, though, is when it's idle, the LEDs are on. And that's kind of opposite the way I would want a hard drive blinking LED. I want it off when it's idle and then flickering when it's working. Um, so that is a big problem. And then um, that, that's a problem I can work around. And I did that with um, a little inverter circuit. So using a, a quad two uh, bipolar transistor, an MPN. So I ran from a five volt supply through, I think I used, ended up uh, with a 150 ohm resistor. It's whatever I had on hand. And then that goes through the hard drive LED on the front of the case, then down through the transistor. And then the base of the transistor, I connected it to the um, this low side of the 330 ohm resistor. So that way, when this guy is shorted to ground, he sees ground. He sees ground. 
he turns off, this LED is off. When this guy disconnects, essentially, this guy will raise up to the same 5 volt USB up here, since no more current flow is going through it. But there will be a trickle current that will come down through here and then through the, uh, the junction on my 5 port transistor and turn him on. So then current will flow through him and he'll turn on. So it works just like an inverter. When these LEDs are on, this LED is off. Um, I originally thought that maybe I would have to put uh, a transistor on the um, on the base to limit the current through it, but it's not pulling enough through this in order to really matter because it has to go through the voltage drops on the LEDs in this 330 ohm. That's, that'll push this well into saturation, but it won't blow it out or anything like that. So, uh, so that's what I pretty much did here. Before I taped it up, I wanted to show you. So I have a little uh, NPN right there. Then I have my resistor coming down off here, and I connected to two of these ceramic capacitors that were right on the 5 hole rail. These are sort of filter caps it has on there. Um, and then there's that little speck right there is that 330 ohm resistor, so I connected it to the one side. Um, that's the side that, uh, that uh, I use with the multimeter to determine it's directly connected to that chipset. So when I put this back together, I'm going to put a bunch of Kapton tape and hold this all down and uh, feed these wires out through a gap over here in the case and then just probably tape the case back together. Um, for what it's worth, Vantec did a very shitty job soldering all this thing together and uh, the case was just super glued together, so not exactly easy to repair. The, uh, the other thing you'll probably notice is the LED flickering is uh, pretty predictable. Um, not a hundred percent sure. It could be flickering on USB activity still, where it's only doing uh, about every half second pulses to the USB interface. I'm not sure if that's what's actually going on. Um, or they could this chipset could be filtering it out, so it's just giving you an even uh, flicker pulse because uh, <laughs> you actually can leak information out of a secure system. Um, through the hard drive LED. So they probably put some artificial filtering to think that they're going to make it super secure and give it another reason to why somebody would want to buy their chipset. Or who knows, maybe that's just a configuration option on this chip because there is an internal spy flash on it to, that can be programmed. Um, so there might be an option on that chip. I don't know. There's, uh, like I said, no part data sheets on it. But what it does give me then, so doing all that stuff... Gives me my nice little hard drive activity blinking. So when it's actually doing stuff, it flickers. It it's better than nothing. I wish it was like a real hard drive activity LED, but I'll live with it for now. So uh, I'm gonna put this all back together and tape it back together, and then we'll resume the video in the future. So all that work just for a little, you know, cosmetic light. <laughs> But it turns out to, to look very nice and gives you, you know, some status of the system's actually doing something. So that's the main guts of it. Um, the Raspberry Pi software itself, I'm running uh, Raspbian Lite. And then I made some modifications in order to do the, the right uh, that occur onto the actual SD card in order to try and increase the, the longevity, longevity of it. And that mostly was uh, modifying the FS tabs file to push all the vo all the uh, logs out to tempfs RAM file systems, and then pretty much after that, all they had to do was turn on um, turn on uh, Samba because I wanted to make this an actual um, network drive share from all my systems, so I could quickly grab data off this data off this drive. And then also install rsync so I can make this thing an rsync server. rsync is what we're going to use to uh, sync from from my NAS over there because it has software on it that can do all this stuff. And then rsync will push the data out to this drive. And there's lots of guides online on how to do all that. So I probably won't um, talk down or talk to all of the, all the details involved there. But uh. 
just give you the overview of what I did for the the, uh, the Raspberry Pi to get it set up to do this. So generally, just like I said, uh, R-Sync and uh, Samba, and that's about it. There's lots of guides on uh, turning Raspberry Pis in the NASes, so it's nothing exactly new. Then for the Wi-Fi, I went with Alpha Networks. They make a wireless N uh, uh, module. This thing, I think, is supposedly rated at like 2 watts or something, which is kind of ridiculous because, I mean, the Wi-Fi standard is not that powerful. But it does come with a nice, I think this is like a, a 9 dB panel antenna. So it's directional. So you have to put face towards enemy and um, point it directly to where the router is going to be. And that gives you significantly better signal to noise ratio over a standard boom antenna. So this does, like I said, suck down quite a bit of power. So that's why I had to go with the um, the USB hub in order to keep it happy. And uh, what I'll do is I will set this up into the shed, probably put this up a little bit higher in order to give a bit more of a, a direct line uh, to the uh, Wi-Fi router. And uh, then I'll set this guy up and turn him on, make sure he was working good, and start pushing some updates down to him. And uh, this will be pretty cool. So combine this with my Wi-Fi router, and we should have pretty plenty of good range because I don't have a wired network out to the shed, but uh, this should do it. So let's check out my Wi-Fi router real quick. So how I get Wi-Fi all the way out to the shed is by this guy. So over here, just in the, pretty much the middle of my living room, is a Ubiquiti Unify access point um, long range. And this does handle up to uh, Wi-Fi G and N, but it's only a 2.4 gigahertz model. And this is only the standard access point. So in this generation, it only had a uh, 100 megabit coming down off the wire. So that's my upper limit of my Wi-Fi access for the whole the whole house. Um, and it's only 100 megabit because it goes through, uh, you can see down here, power over ethernet adapter. So regular ethernet goes into him and then out of it comes both power and ethernet for the rest of the system. So this is what's giving me my range down there. <clears throat> and um, I've always had trouble with Wi-Fi in this house in general because it's uh, built on fairly thick plaster walls and uh, the exterior of the house is brick which is both not very good for Wi-Fi. And all the commercial solutions I found were atrocious. So if you go, even looking at even any of the new ones, you look at the reviews and everyone says, yeah, they're fast as hell, as long as you ignore all the bugs that they will hopefully eventually fix. Well, my experience, they rarely ever fix them, or there's several of them where you have like a, just a, a lingering issue where you know you end up having to reboot the router once a month. Fortunately, I've never come across a good commercial one that has been reliable. This guy is rock solid, so never had to worry anything about him. So now that we got that set up, let's go down to the shed. Check it out. Okay, so here we are in the shed, all set up. Got it plugged into my new fancy outlet I put in. Got the Wi-Fi adapter up. Um, it's actually at, at head height, and that actually ends up working out fairly well with the... Um, the elevation in my yard so that should work pretty well and uh, we'll try this out so I mean if it, of course should have powered it up before I started but um, hopefully we'll actually see some little bit more hard drive activity and uh, we'll give it a go and see how it does but um, this should work great this is going to be a significant amount of backup improvement to what I got excellent